Good morning, church, and welcome to our Sunday morning service. First Chronicles 16 says, Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. So church, let us join together this morning and humble our hearts as we approach the throne of God in worship. Let us sing of his great deeds and declare his majesty this morning. Please join me in saying how great is our God. The splendor of the King, cold in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. The sun comes 
rise up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when. Father, we thank you that we can worship you this morning because we have been justified by faith. We have peace with you through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. By your grace, we have access to your holy, joyful, and transforming presence. We no longer have to live in fear or worry, but we rejoice in hope of your glory. I ask that we become more like Jesus in our daily lives, living with humility gentleness, and kindness. Amen. Jesus Messiah. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so
blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Let's continue reading 1 Chronicles 16. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Verse 35 says, save us, O God, of our salvation, and gather and deliver us from among the nations. 
that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Brothers and sisters, how can we, how can you individually bring an offering to the Lord today, this week? How do we give God the glory that he is due to praise him for his deliverance and salvation? A few weeks ago, we sang a new song called Unbroken Praise. And the lyric says, Lord, take this life, let it become your throne. Unbroken praise be yours. Church, may we make this song our prayer this morning, that we may completely surrender and wholly devote our lives as our act of worship. Let's sing.
morning, everyone. It is now time for intercessory prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. You sustain our daily life and remind us of your faithfulness and mercy. We experience your love and desire to be with us, and we thank you for listening to our prayers. We lift up our church into your care. You have entrusted Pastor Victor to watch over your flock. We pray that you will fill our pastor with joy and peace as he trusts in you. Fill his message with the power of your word and of the Holy Spirit. Help our congregation to receive your word and to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to abide in you so that we can bear the fruit of the Spirit, showing ourselves to be your disciples. We pray for the love in action emphasis on membership this month. Thank you for establishing ESCOM as a local church where we as believers are called to be a member committed to the body of Christ. Help those who are thinking of membership to identify themselves in a local church and renew their desire to be in a covenant community and exercising their spiritual gifts for your glory. Lord, we pray that members within our church will experience a spirit of unity and accountability. Refresh our commitment to love and serve one another through your strength. We pray for the search of an assistant pastor with a youth focus. You know the present needs of our church and the pastor who will be joining as calm. We pray that you will prepare their heart for this role and guide their steps through this process. We pray that you will give the search committee guidance, wisdom, and discernment in this search. Help us to recognize the pastor that you have provided and all the godly characteristics of a servant's heart. We pray for the worship leaders and the team you have appointed to lead your church through songs and praise. Fill them with the spirit of joy as they receive the fullness of your presence in each service. We pray for rest and renewal for the leaders who are gathered weekly to serve you. Help them to quiet themselves, surrender their plans to you, Lord, and abide in your word as they experience your incomprehensible peace. We pray for comfort and healing for those who are sick, diagnosed with cancer, and going through trials of many kinds. While we do not fully understand the suffering, we thank God that there is hope and healing through faith. We seek your help and healing because you are the God of compassion who comforts us in all our troubles. We pray that in our weakest moments, your presence will be magnified. Help us to rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, and constant in prayer. We pray for the expecting and new mothers in our church. We pray for the fathers who are supporting and preparing for the baby. We celebrate with Steve and Lisa Ng as they welcome Claris into their family. Thank you for the gift of each new life. We pray that you will bless your children as they grow. Give the parents love and strength through the highs and lows of caring for a newborn baby. We pray for international workers serving to make disciples of all nations. Help them to magnify your love and truth in the communities they serve. Around the world, many believers are persecuted for their faith. Father, we pray that your spirit will strengthen and comfort them. Help them to experience overwhelming hope and joy because in times of need, you supply all that we need. Father, you know all of our needs and requests of our church. We commit them to you. Lead us into your perfect peace as we trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kimberly. Our scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 11, verses 1 to 27, 38 to 44. Let us read together. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, 
so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our ESCOM Sunday service here today. Life, as you know it, it consists of many ups and downs, ups and downs throughout our journey on this earth. Well, the COVID-19 vaccines are rolling out and some people think it's at a snail's pace, but I, I don't think it's too bad. And um, the stay at home orders have been lifted. So there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, isn't there? And I really hope that you are actually on a high right now and not on a low. But again, life consists of highs and lows, ups and downs in life. As we come to John chapter 11 today in our service, we come to what really looks like and feels like a low point in life because chapter 11 deals with a very, very morbid topic, death. Someone has died. Now, I don't know a lower time in a person's life than when someone very, very close to us passes away and dies. I can't normally talk about death or about someone's recent death uh, because when I talk about someone's recent death, I usually get all tearied up and 
I, I, I will break out and I'll start crying. And whenever I start crying, it's never a pretty thing. It's not. And so what I normally do when I speak about death or uh, someone passing away, I usually talk about someone decades ago. Why? Because death, I tell you, death is a fact of life and it is a ruthless evil. It's not an easy topic to talk about. It often comes without warnings. It strikes without mercy. It's unrelenting death. Death cannot be cheated. Death cannot be bribed. Death cannot be eluded. And it's true. Death strikes those who are young and those who are old. Death strikes those who are sick. Those who are not so sick and are very healthy, death strikes the rich and the poor all alike because it's universal. So yes, death is a harsh reality of everyday life. And I don't think we should ever take the gift of another day that God gives to us. We should never take another day for granted. I mean, most of us probably assume we'll age to the ripe old age of 80 or 90 or 95. Uh, but no, 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 we should never take that for granted because we don't know when death will uh, visit us. Many decades ago, I was with a young couple and um, we were in the eMERGE at the hospital. Why? Um, because something had happened. I had married this young couple just a year and a half previously to that time in eMERGE. And within those one and a half years that they were married, about one year into their marriage, she was diagnosed with cancer, a very severe form of cancer. Um, and it was, had been diagnosed in, in her for about six months now. So I was with the couple in, in the ICU. And when she died in his arms in the ICU, it had to be one of the most excruciating, painful, difficult experiences I have ever had as a pastor. And I'm sure it was one of the most difficult things anybody would ever go through. And it was a, a true wake up call never to take life for granted. And I think when the news hit our church at that time, it was just such an awakening never to take life for granted because of the harsh reality of physical death. Death, physical death is never pretty. It never is. But as we come to the death of Lazarus in our story in the Gospel of John chapter 11, there is this super dark and heavy cloud in the first 37 verses that deals with the death of Lazarus. I mean, the ambiance, the atmosphere there is one that is dark. There's a heaviness there. There's grief. It, grief has stricken the people there in the story for sure. So if you have your devices or your Bibles, let's turn to John chapter 11. And thank you, Kim, for your reading. It was so appropriate uh, considering the, the morbid topic that's, that's being dealt with here. And I think the main point or the prime directive of John chapter 11, in my opinion, is simply this. Death is a ruthless evil for sure, but it does not have the final say about our lives from birth to eternity. Death is a ruthless evil for sure, but it does not have the final say in our lives from our birth to all of eternity. In John chapter 11, in these first 27 verses, I'm going to try to answer some very difficult questions, some very uh, obvious questions that come out of this text. I mean, does Jesus really care about Lazarus and Martha and Mary? Does he? Uh, because if he does, why does he wait so long before he goes to the home of where this death has taken place? I mean, why does Jesus, why does it take him four days before he gets to the home of Martha and Mary? Because he could have done it much faster than four days if he wanted to. Uh, and, and another question really comes from verses 25 and, and 26, um, because look, what does this mean? Jesus says to her in verse 25, 
Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Who, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So, I mean, these are two or three really obvious key questions that can help us to, to, to learn what's the meaning of the text here. Uh, I mean, if we want to gain spiritually and, and enrich our lives, I, I mean, we have to find out about the, the writer, the gospel writer John here. Uh, what does Jesus really care about Mary and Martha and Lazarus? Does he? I, I mean, he could have actually made it to their home from where he was in two days. That's unbelievable. But he waited. He waited and didn't get there till four. Um, so if we want to grow and enrich our lives, we have to get beneath the surface and dig deeply into the meaning of the text here. So let's look at verses 1 to 27 here in our chapter 11 today. Verse 1, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. He was sick. So the sister sent to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone or to kill you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to Jesus, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Now, verse 17, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Wow, wow. There's a lot there, isn't there? There is. So to put this in its proper context, after Jesus' last encounter with those religious leaders, those Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, back in chapter 10, where Jesus said, I and the Father are one, and, and they, 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 they wanted to kill him. I mean, Jesus left there and took refuge in the wilderness. He kind of laid low for a while because they were out to kill him. 
He ministered in that wilderness to the disciples of John the Baptist. And he received word from Mary and Martha saying that uh, their brother, Jesus' friend Lazarus, has taken, uh, has become very, very ill. And, and, and so Jesus' immediate response when he got the message was, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. That was Jesus' immediate response. And then the writer, John, he, in verse 6, he actually writes that Jesus now, after he got the message, lingered about for two days, he says in verse 6. Two days longer, because it takes about two days to, to travel by foot uh, to go to Bethany. What? He lingered for two days? So let's take a look at and estimate a timeline here. The timeline is simply this. On day one in Jesus' life, he receives word that Lazarus has taken gravely ill. He's very sick. Then on day two, Jesus deliberately stays and lingers behind for two days. And then on day three, he now decides to go to Judea. In, in verse 7 it says, and the disciples say, no, 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 don't do it. Don't you know they're out there trying to kill you again? You're not going back there, are you, Jesus? But, but, but he does. He departs for Judea. And then on day four, um, he arrives in Bethany. And he has been told that Lazarus, he has already died and been buried. He's been there for four days, buried in the tomb. And that's what's written in verse 17. So we, we, we have this timeline here that we can put together. Uh, if, if this, I mean, it's just an estimated timeline, by the way. There's nothing definitive about it. But if you are an exceedingly smart person in mathematics, it's easy to realize that actually, if you put it all together, Lazarus has already died on the day that Jesus received the message from the messengers that he was gravely ill. Uh, I, I mean, it's incredible here. The messengers did not know Lazarus has already died. Nobody outside of their town of Bethany knew that Lazarus has already died and been buried. The disciples were in the wilderness with Jesus. They could not have known that Lazarus has already died. They thought he was still just sick. The only one outside of Bethany that could have known that Lazarus has already died, it's Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus says in verse 4, he basically says, when he gets the message, no worries, everyone, no worries. That illness will not, does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through this event. And, and then John the writer, he, 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 he puts his editorial comment in verses 5 to 7. And, and take a look at what John writes in verses 5 to 7. He wants to make sure everyone knows this. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. You see, from a human perspective, from the eyes of humanity, it really does look like Jesus didn't care. Why on earth would he linger another couple of days if one of his close friends has already, he's deathly ill? I mean, it doesn't make no sense from a human perspective. The optics are really, really bad. And, but what we need to know is Jesus somehow knew that Lazarus has already died when he received that message. You see, it really does look like Jesus didn't care from a human perspective. And, and, and why that is is because we human beings, sometimes we judge far too quickly on what we know at the point in time. It looks like Jesus didn't care very much about Mary and Martha he's, or Lazarus. He's lingering behind another two days. You see, when we human beings judge too quickly without knowing everything, 
we are almost guaranteed to get it wrong each and every time because of the optics. Jesus knows that Lazarus' sickness does not end in death. He knows that because he is God. And he says so. Why? Because death does not have the final word from birth to eternity in the life of Lazarus. And, and, and so, well, if death doesn't have the final word, who does? Well, we who are believers, we believe God has the final word. There's no question about it. But, but as Jesus begins to go towards Bethany, the disciples basically shout out, are you crazy? You're going back into the lion's den where those Jewish leaders are trying to kill you? And, ah, oh, ah, oh, Jesus is going back to Jerusalem. He is going back to where the Jewish leaders want him dead because now it begins the journey of Jesus to the cross. This is the beginning of Jesus' journey to the cross. It's his time. Next week, Pastor Ian will be here. He's going to be preaching about the, the triumphant entry here. But, but, but back in our story, I mean, what does Jesus say to his disciples in verses 9 to 15? Take a look with me at verses 9 to 15. Jesus' response is, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anybody walks in the darkness or in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant about taking a nap, power nap. Verse 14, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. You see, again, the disciples reveal their earthly and humanistic perspective and their view of death. That death is dark, death is bad, death is evil. It's the end. It's a finality. That's the end of it if if a person dies. Well, that's their human view of death for sure. It's a finality. And and because that's their view, they say, Jesus, why are you going back? They're going to kill you because they think death is a finality, but it's not. Lazarus here, if he is asleep, he will eventually wake up and recover. And, and, and Jesus basically says to them, no, 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 I'm not talking about just taking a power nap. He clarified, Lazarus is D-E-A-D. Lazarus is dead. He has died. Ooh, okay. Jesus has now clarified for his disciples. Now they know. And and then in verses 17 to 27, they arrive at the house in Bethany. And the writer John wants all his readers to see and to know that Jesus, the Son of God, he has authority and power over death. Why? Because Jesus Christ is God. Take a look at verses 17 to 27 here. This is incredible. Verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days, four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother Lazarus. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, oh, I know. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So here in Bethany at their home, the mourners have come. They are mourning. They're gathering because of the death of Lazarus. 
And, and what most people do not know is there's this belief in the near ancient Eastern custom. Uh, they must wrap the body of the deceased person in spice soaked linen. And on that very same day that the person has, has died and has been wrapped in all the spikes so linen, that person must be wow, mummified and put into the tomb, buried in the cave. And John specifically included that, and wrote specifically that Jesus arrived on which day? He arrived on the fourth day. On the fourth day that Lazarus had been buried in the tomb. Now, some historians recognize that this could be very, very intentional because in the rabbinic teaching, the teaching of the rabbis over the centuries, I, I mean, they taught, that it was commonly believed among the rabbis that the soul of someone who has just passed away will hover around the dead body, hoping that the dead body will recover. And if the dead body recovers, the, 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 the the, the soul or the spirit will, will, will re-enter the, the body. But, but the rabbinic teaching was that was only for three days. On the fourth day, the soul would leave because there was no chance that the body could rise up again because of the decay of the physical body. So after day three, it was unthinkable. And in the mind of the Near Eastern people, it was impossible for the person to return to life. And if this was the prevailing belief among the people in Jesus' day, I mean, it's no wonder why Jesus waited well past a third day and would arrive after that to uh, visit to Lazarus' tomb. He had already been buried for four days. Jesus proclaimed to them and said, oh, that beautiful phrase, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and has life and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And again, we hear Martha's most beautiful proclamation of the identity of Jesus. She says in verse 27, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus weeps, and he eventually goes to the tomb. Look with me at verses 38 to 44. Here in verse 38, um, touching, so touching, verse 38. Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. But Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, a stink, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing all around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, um, unbind him and let him go. Let him go. Let him live life. What does Martha say? No, 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 no. Don't do it, Jesus. No, no, no. The body's been decaying for four days already. It's going to stink. There's going to be a really bad odor. Jesus says, but did you not say you believe? Yes, Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And so for the glory of God, Jesus resurrects Lazarus back into his old body, the mummified Lazarus, who was dead, who had died, returns from beyond. How amazing is that? I wish I would have been there to witness it. Jesus prays aloud so that all who were there, who were able to hear, would recognize that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and God has sent him, and they together, the Father and the Son, are behind this miraculous resurrection. 
Wow! It seems to me that physical death is not the original design nor intent of God. Death is not the will of the Heavenly Father. It's not. I think the Heavenly Father looks at death and is despised of death. Physical death is the result of sin. And Jesus was here to reclaim Lazarus from the enemy and to allow Lazarus to continue to experience true life, abundant life, eternal life. And so Lazarus responds to Jesus' voice and arises. Again, what does this prove? It proves that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. And later on in his life, Lazarus eventually did die again, physically die again. And again, now Lazarus is awaiting the final resurrection. And I think that we all need to recognize we will all eventually await the final resurrection. And when the final resurrection comes, we'll be called from beyond. And the question is, when you are called from beyond, will you be summoned to go to the place that is called heaven in the presence of God with no evil, no darkness, no sin, no tear, no nothing except the glory of God? Or will you be summoned to go take your place in the place known as hell in the Bible? where there is no good thing and eternal torment. And so we try to bring it all together now and ask the, the question as we begin to wrap up, I mean, what can we learn from this passage for us today? Well, I think it's quite clear what, what we can learn. I mean, from our human view and our human perspective, life can be messy. Life is full of ups and downs, ups and downs, sometimes more downs than ups, it's for sure. And they always seem so random from a humanistic perspective. But from God's vantage point, from a spiritual perspective, what we learn is God has a better plan, and God has a better time, and God has a better strategy and a better future for those who are in Jesus Christ. Here we have two women, two ladies, who knew the Son of God as well as I know some of my closest friends that I have. And yet, these two ladies, they struggle to understand Jesus' handling of the death of Lazarus, his supposed friend. Oh, they say, if you had only been here, he wouldn't have died. Oh, really? You see, they are again revealing their humanistic view of death. If you were only here, Jesus, our brother would not have died. It's not really true. He could have died anyways, even if Jesus was there. But, but, but Jesus, and, and, and what Mary and Martha didn't realize is Jesus has already healed Lazarus and Mary and Martha for all of eternity by reconciling them back to the Heavenly Father. But these two women just didn't know that, couldn't see it, couldn't, could not understand it because of their humanistic perspective. Again, death, physical death, is not the invention of God. It's the consequence of sin and darkness. But God has provided a remedy. He's provided a solution, and that is Jesus Christ, His Son, in whom we need to accept on his terms and to follow him because it's the only way. Accepting Jesus Christ and following him on his terms. And how does that apply to us today? I mean, when events don't go the way we think they should go as a human being, we need to recognize that God has a better time. God has a better plan. God has a better future for every single one of us who are children of God. And so if we miss a flight on an airplane, no need to fret. If we miss an appointment for something, uh, a a, to take the train to go to another city for an interview, uh, and because we're late, we don't even get the job. Well, that's okay if we are children of God, because God has a better time 
And God has a better plan. And God has a better design for us that we may not even know yet. And so when we put an offer into that, for that house we want to buy or for that condo we want to buy, and it's rejected, don't fret. It's okay. God has a better plan. God has a better time. God has a better future. When we get news of a medical condition that might even be incurable, fatal, it's okay. Why? Because God has a better time. God has a better plan. God has a better future that we can never, ever imagine how good that future is. It's incredible that when we start to see things from a spiritual perspective, it can take away the worries of life, the disappointments of life, and bring to us a peace and a serenity that can only be found in Jesus Christ. God always has a better time. God always has a better plan. God always has a better future that we might not be able to see. And in order for us to experience this better and eternal life, it all starts, it all starts by having Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior on His terms. The eternal life that Jesus offers us reigns supreme over death and reconciles us back to our Heavenly Father. Yes, death is a ruthless evil, but it never has the final word, because that final word is left alone to God and to God alone. Let's close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this experience of seeing Lazarus being brought back from beyond. It was just an illustration of the power and the authority of Jesus' miraculous divine position. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us and melt our hearts and our will and to open our eyes to see Jesus for who he is so that we might be that person who has been converted from death into eternal life because of Jesus Christ. Continue to transform our lives and have mercy on us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Victor, for your message this morning. Let us join together in worship and respond by saying, Living Hope.
Good morning, church. Last night, we launched our very first Love in Action prayer line, and we are hoping that this would continue on every month, on every second Saturday of the month. And so if you are interested in being part of this ministry, if you want to be one of our intercessors, someone to come and pray for people, please connect with me. I would love to to chat with you. I would love to plug you in um, into this ministry. And also we continue on with our March membership. And last week we heard from Gabe, Justin, and Sharon, um, three people who grew up at ESCOM and just shared their passion for the church and their love for the church. And so today I've invited two fairly new ESCOMers. They've only been um, attending our church for, I think, three years, but they've also already committed and join membership, and I just want them to share their stories with us. Welcome, Debbie and Joel. Thank you for joining me today. Um, Last week, we had invited, or I had invited Sharon, Justin, and Gabe to share just, you know, their journey of um, becoming members at ESCOM because the three of them grew up at ESCOM. But both of you um, have actually been very recent Um, attendees here at ESCOM. I think both of you similarly around three years, um, three years ago that you've started coming. And so I'm actually really appreciative of the fact that you are already members. And so, you know, I invited you to come this morning to to share with us your journey um, of why you decided in such a short period of time to become members. So why don't we start with Debbie? Um, Well, after about a year of attending um, services at ESCOM, my family and I decided that uh, ESCOM was going to be our home church. It fit, uh, the people were great, and uh, we liked the services. So when uh, Pastor Vic announced um, that there were going to be membership classes, my husband Matthew and I uh, decided to attend and we wanted to make a formal commitment uh, to ESCOM to be part of its family. So after the membership classes, we applied for membership. And um, what I really appreciate about um, being a member um, is um, having a voice uh, with the decisions and the direction of the church and also um, having a better understanding of the different areas and needs within our church. Um, For example, finances, renovations, and different ministry uh, needs. Before uh, becoming a member, um, I was kind of on the sidelines and I didn't really know what was happening or what was going on. But once you attend some membership meetings, you really get a good understanding of, you know, what the needs of our church are so so that you can help out wherever you can. Great. Thank you. Um, Joel? Uh, thanks, Eileen. Um, I don't know if any, many people know, but I grew up in a church where membership was not really part of the church culture. You were just, you know, it was part of, you know, the type of church that it was. And I grew up in that environment. So for me, membership was kind of a new concept. The last church, however, the last local church that I attended up in Markham for probably about the last 10 years or so before coming to SFOM, uh, had a membership structure, a membership requirement. Um, and I was a member there for quite a while and in doing so served in a number of areas of the church on the worship team, uh, ultimately as an elder for three years. Um, but then at, toward the end of that 10 year period, you know, I kind of felt God calling me to a different place. At the time there was felt like it was coming to an end. So I knew some people going to ESCOM, so I started attending there, kind of like Debbie for about a year or so, um, you know, half there, half at the other place. Um, but then, you know, it felt uh, it felt like home. I, I love the people. I love the the ministries, the, the the direction of the church. And so, you know, I'm the type of person that likes to help out, want to get involved. And you know, in order to do that, I had to be a member. And so, once the classes were announced again, I attended and um, wanted to make a formal commitment to membership. And now, 
you know, serving on one of the worship teams and as a deacon of missions and, and very happy to do so. I think, you know, just making membership uh, is really about making a commitment to the people in this local church. Uh, we can count on each other and help each other and support each other um, through the mission that this church has. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing because I think, you know, different perspectives from from the oldies, from the newbies, um, we get to see, you know, you guys are not the oldies, you guys are the newbies. <laughs> That's good to know. Yes. Um, just to be able to see, you know, the end goal is really to show our commitment to each other, but ultimately our commitment in saying, God, we belong to this church that you have called us. And so for, for you at home, um, you know, if you're starting to, to think about membership, we invite you to come out um, in April when membership classes will be made available. And so in the next few weeks, I'll be uh, making announcements on when these classes will happen. And we really hope to see you there. So thank you for listening to this announcement. Well, thank you, Eileen and Debbie and Joel. Thank you for sharing about your journey to ESCOM here and your wonderful example of commitment and membership. Let's now close in prayer together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we recognize that it is you working in our lives. And through the ups and downs of life, you give us the church and you give us one another. You give us Jesus Christ. You give us your grace so that we might be able to deal with life's ups and downs together and not in isolation. So we thank you for that and thank you for the wonderful service that we've had today. And now, may the God of all hope and may Jesus Christ, the living hope, may he be the one who will continue to be glorified in everything that we do. Fill us with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that we all may overflow with his hope by the power of His Holy Spirit. And all of God's people say together, Amen, Amen. Thank you for being here with us today. We greatly appreciate it and pray that it has been beneficial for you and for all of your families. Take care. See you the next time around. Amen.